Well, welcome to session four of A Life Well Lived. But tonight we're going to talk about mission. We're going to talk about setting a personal mission statement. And uh, that might seem like a little bit of a daunting task. I say sometimes, well, let's create a personal mission statement. And, and somehow I think people hear, let's create a budget or something like that. But, but it's not that. It's, um, it's fun and it's a good thing to do. The Bible verse for for this session is Matthew 6, It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The first part of creating a mission statement is considering success. God, uh, God called me out of the, the legal industry. I don't think there's anything wrong with the legal industry. Um, but I felt like God, God showed me that what he was doing in my life is preparing me for something else. And so I decided to go into full-time mission work at, in 2004. And uh, I started traveling around the world and, and studying uh, mission work and, and helping to bring this technology services that I was given in the courtroom to help different missionaries and ministers. And in 2006, I, I learned what success is or how to determine success. And I was at a, uh, I was in Malawi, and we were going out and we were visiting a refugee camp. And by this time, I had been all over different places in Africa, and I had seen poverty, and uh, I had seen just, you know, the the uh, the huge difference of, you know, economic differences and, and cultural differences. But when I went into this refugee camp, it was it was shocking. I had never seen the poverty like I saw in this refugee camp. I mean, there were kids walking around with dirt on their face, like with a, 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 a scrap of clothes. You know, it wasn't even like a shirt or something. It was just like a piece of a shirt. And I was just, you could feel the heaviness and the weight in this place. And as I looked around, I, I, I asked the pastor that had taken us in, and I said, well, can't, I mean, can't, isn't there any work? I mean, can they go get jobs? Can they do anything? And he said, well, how long did it take to get to this refugee camp? And I said, well, you know, it's like about three hours. He's like, yeah, and we had a car. And I was like, yeah. And he said, well, they get fed once a day. And if, uh, if you go into town, if you can hitch a ride into town and you're not able to get back uh, by evening, then you're off the list and you don't get fed anymore. And so they were just stuck in this refugee camp. And then I said, well, how long, how long have people been here? And the pastor said, eight years. And I was like, it was the most challenging moment I've ever had in my life because I saw just destitute poverty. And I said, I, in my heart, I said, how can there be a good God? And I said to the pastor, I said, is this the mercy of God? How can this be the mercy of God? And the pastor said, oh, yeah, this is the mercy of God. And I said, what are you talking about? How can this possibly be the mercy of God? And he said, well, let me tell you about one of my students. He said, now, he was a pastor that was actually training pastors in this refugee camp to go and serve people, and uh, he was teaching them the Bible. And uh, I, I visited the class, and it was just, I mean, it was just this really bright spot. There was these happy faces. And uh, one of the pastors was like, I love this course, because in this course, I learned that there is a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I love this course. And so, you know, these pastors were in there in this little group. But one of those pastors came up to, to the pastor that brought us in, and he said, before I came to this refugee camp, I had a car, I had a job, and life was great. He said, but I never, ever thought about God. He never entered my consciousness. I didn't think about God. He said, but then there was a war in my country, and all of these horrible things happened, and I ended up in this refugee camp. And I thought about God every day because I said, there must be something more than this. Why, why am I here? And, uh, and he said, I found Jesus. And I learned that there was a heaven and a hell. 
and I, I've developed a relationship with Jesus, and I didn't even know that you could have a relationship with God. And he said, and my life is full, and I'm glad that I'm in this refugee camp because this refugee camp is temporary, but my life with Jesus is forever. Now, I have seen the worst poverty that I could imagine, and I saw somebody full of joy. I've also seen incredible opulence full of misery. And I learned that success isn't about what you have. So I wrote a a description of what is success. Success is loving God with your heart, mind, and soul, and living life in light of eternity. You know, the passage, um, when they came to Jesus and said, Master, what do I need to do to have success? What do I I need to do to, to make it to heaven? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So within this, we have, I believe that success is first, it's loving God. And then God says also to go and love people. Now, I want to I draw a little bit of a, a juxtaposition between the, the way that the world gauges success and the way that the kingdom judges uh, success. And, uh, and so the question is, how does the world measure success? You know, the Apostle John, he, he wrote a very succinct statement of the world. He said, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And he says, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Now, everything that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Now, we know already that In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there is pleasure forevermore. So when you hear lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and pride of life, that doesn't mean no pleasure. You know, because if it does, that's the terrible. But it doesn't mean no pleasure. It means finding pleasure outside of what God has decided to give us. So the lust of the flesh is just anything that I can get my hands on that I think is going to bring me satisfaction. You know, it's the lust of the flesh. I can touch it. And then there's the lust of the eyes. That's anything that I can get, you know, that, that is, is out there. I, I can't get my hands on it. But man, if I could, I would take that thing. And then the pride of life is simply trying to be God. The pride of life is saying, well, I am better than these other little peons. I must be awesome, and uh, I don't need God. That's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. If you want to have a good example of what is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, turn on your TV or drive down the road or get any kind of magazine or anything because that's what we are bombarded with for, from life. If you have this hot fudge sundae, you will be awesome. If you buy this car, you will have several babes to show up at your doorstep. If you you make this career move, you will be an awesome professor and all will kneel before you. And it's a lie. It's, It's not true. It doesn't bring satisfaction. But being an ambassador for the kingdom of God, being a, a part of the kingdom, it, it's awesome. Um, Jesus talked about this difference between the world and the kingdom. And uh, he was telling his disciples, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain. But he's always keeping this in mind. And be raised the third day. And he said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. 
But whoever will lose his life for my name's sake, the same shall save it. Now, that's another one of these verses that just didn't make any sense to me at all. Whoever will save his life will lose it? What the heck does that mean? How am I going to save my life and lose it? What he's talking about is saving your life of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. If you hang on to everything that this world is trying to give you on a platter, you, you lose it. You lose satisfaction and joy, and you're a junkie for it, and it doesn't satisfy. But if you give those things up and say, I want the better of Jesus, then you gain it, and you have fullness of life and joy. Jesus said, whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my name's sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. You know, there is a, there is a movement. I, I have a Christian ministry, and there's a movement in lots of Christian ministries to take the name Jesus out of anything. And don't ever say you're a Christian and don't ever talk about God. Because they say, if you do really good works, then people will just know you're a Christian and they'll see your love and they'll ask you, why did you do this? And I'm all about Francis of Assisi, you know, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. But I'm also proud to be a Christian. I'm proud that I, I mean, I'm not proud of me, but I'm proud of my God. He's awesome. And I don't want you to think that I did something because I just have this awesomeness inside of me. Well, actually, I do. It's the Holy Spirit. I, I want you to know that I did it because I love my God, and he loves you too. And I, I don't want to walk around being ashamed of Jesus Christ. I think it's time for some really awesome servant-hearted people to go out and serve the tar out of life and then say, and I'm a Christian, uh, Steve Green, he said, to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission. The spring from which our service overflows, across the street or around the world, the mission is still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. This is the heartbeat of our mission. It's to love God with our heart and our mind and our soul. Um, a truly successful mission is also going to be founded on biblical principles. And I'm going to go through four biblical principles that when you consider your mission, why are you on the planet? What is the work that God has called you to do and called me to do? Let's look at four different uh, principles. The first is a transformed life. The Apostle Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And there's two words there that I want to talk about. The first word is conformed, and the second is transformed. The word conformed there is like what you do to clay. So if I take a piece of clay and I kind of smush it into like a little, you know, turtle shape or something like that, then I've created a turtle, you know, an image of a turtle with my clay. So that's being conformed. And, and Paul said, don't be, don't let this world knock you around and shape you like that. He said, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that word transformed is metamorphosis. It's the difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly. And the thing is, is that when you're a Christian, you're a butterfly. You're a different, you know, a different substance, made out of the same stuff, kind of, but transformed. And, uh, you know, no matter how hard a caterpillar tries to be good, you know, you can tape some wings on a caterpillar and like paint him like a real pretty butterfly and you can like put little, you know, bug antennas on a caterpillar or whatever. He's not going to fly. 
It's still a caterpillar. And trying to become, like, trying to do good works and serve God, you know, without having the life of Christ in you and without relying on his life, it's like trying to get a caterpillar to fly. But that's not our problem. Our problem is, is that we forget that we're butterflies. Because when you've been transformed into a butterfly, you can fly. But God is not necessarily con con concerned so much with what you do as much as he's concerned with who you are. Do you realize you're a butterfly? Do you realize that with the life of Christ in you, you can live a holy Christian life? Now, it's the saddest thing in the world. I, I don't, I've never seen this before, but I'm sure that there are some butterflies that do this. They're beautiful. They've got these wings, and they could do that, and they walk around all the time going, oh, I'm a caterpillar. I'm just a terrible caterpillar. I can't do anything. I guess I'll have to just grime around on this dirt because that's all I am. What would you say to that, cat, that butterfly? You're like, no, don't do that. You're a butterfly. Fly. You know, I think this verse in Romans 12, it's like it's reminding the butterfly that you're a butterfly. We've been thinking like caterpillars so long, we forget how to think like a butterfly. And the Word of God is there to transform your mind to remember that you are a new creature and live with that kind of a life mission. Does that make sense? Am I losing some people? Okay, a little butterfly and caterpillar. Okay, I got I to make sure I see a couple nods every once in a while, make sure that I'm on track. The second is a focus on family. And... Uh, you know, Paul said, if anybody does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You know, when God made male and female in his image, there's a reflection of God that comes from a male and a female because God is so much bigger than just like a man. He, he created man and woman, you know, both in his image to reflect who he is. There's an immediate relationship there. And so all ministry from God is birthed out of relationship. God is, in himself is three. So when we are to go and serve, you'll find throughout the Bible there's a focus on family. The tribes of Israel were a family, you know. This family did this. This family did that. Um, and that's important for us to focus on. And uh, this is a great verse in Ephesians 5.33. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, there are two key words that you want to take out of this verse. If you are a woman, then you want to take out of this verse, respect. All the time, my wife is telling me, I love you, I love you. And I'm like, honey, what I want to hear is you're so awesome. I can't believe you. You provide for our family so great, and I really respect everything you do. When I got a guy, we, we love that. Like, I mean, it's like if you respect me, like two guys can totally get together and be like, you're a jerk, you're a jerk, but man, you play football great, thanks. And they're like, oh, they're great friends. <laughs> you know, uh, respect, it's huge. If you, if you want a man to be happy, just respect him. And then men, husbands, love. Your wife, you know, yes, she wants you to respect her and, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C, all this. But she just wants to be loved. She wants to be held and cherished and nourished. I, go, I, I make the mistake all the time. Well, honey, I mean, I washed the dishes. I brought to work. I did all this. I just want you to love me. I know. That's, I'm sorry. I'm, I got to work that. Husbands, love your wives, you know. Uh, Wives, respect your husbands. There's a marriage seminar in a box, right? I'll just say, that's one verse. That's a good one. Uh, and then children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, uh, if we don't grow up learning that when we're in charge of things, it, it, they get messy, we really need to. If, if, if ch children need to learn... It's actually better for me to have an authority in my life that I trust and that loves me than to just think my way is the way to go. Because if you live a life seeking yourself, you're going to ruin yourself. 
I'm, I'm going to ruin myself if, I, if I'm just getting my own way all the time. So children are to be taught by their parents how to respect and honor authority and grow. But this, this family focus isn't just for married people and people with kids. When you are joined into the family of God, you join into the largest family on earth. And God calls us brothers and sisters. And if you're a single or a widower or, or whatever, you are a part of a family. And God wants to reach his church through family. The third focus is community. In Romans 12, 5, it says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And it also says in Hebrews, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. If you are going to be on mission with God, you will be on mission to building and working with your community. And finally, there's a focus on charity. I was in South Africa, and I was, uh, I was working with a missionary named Young Ohm. He's a South Korean missionary. And uh, Young said, Josh, you're from America, right? And I said, yeah, yep. Yeah. And he said, uh, you know what you focus on in America? And I'm like, I bet you're going to tell me. <laughs> and he said, I just came back from America. Every radio station I went to, every church that I went to, you know what the main consideration was everywhere? I said, what? He said, security. He said, everywhere I went, I heard this. Make sure you're secure. Make sure you have tons of money and then go serve people. And he said, and I can prove it. And I said, okay. He said, if I gave you a million dollars right now, what would you do with it? And I said, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'd really have to pray about that. And he said, you'd put it in the bank for security. He said, you know what I'd do with a million dollars right now? I said, what? He said, I'd build a vocational training center. I'd build a daycare. I'd build this and I'd build that. And he said, if you didn't have a purpose of building God's kingdom with your money, then why would God give you money? And I thought about that. And, and I thought about it in my own life. Am I focused on security more than charity? And so Young challenged me to create uh, an eternal spending plan. And I went through the Bible, and I just asked God to show me what is his priority in spending to build the kingdom? What does he want us to do? And I, I looked, and I think I've got 10 areas, and I think they, they cover a pretty, it's pretty comprehensive. The first area is the voiceless. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge fairly, and defend the rights of the poor and needy. Another area in James, it says, pure religion and undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the orphan and the widow in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So there's the voiceless, there's widows and orphans. In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the end of the age, and he talks about separating sheep and goats, and, and the sheep are the ones that, that accepted Christ and followed him. And he said, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Do you want joy in your life? In his presence, there is fullness of joy. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Do you know where the presence of God is? It's around the hungry and the naked and the thirsty and the stranger and the prisoner and the sick. When you serve, it is, it is a scientific fact that it is impossible to feel depressed and serve at the same time. That is medically proven by science. You cannot be serving someone and feel depressed. And man, God wants us to be happy. There's plenty of, of people around the world that we can go and serve, and it's a, it's a priority. Then... Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is the Great Commission. 
Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are 10 areas that I believe that God has called us to in charity. So when we look at these areas, what does the Bible say to consider success, to consider your mission? What are you going to do on earth? I believe the first is a transformed life. And second is focusing on your family. And third is building community and being a part of your community. And finally, I think, I know that God has us uh, to, to do charity. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about creating a personal mission statement. And I want to give you some, some pointers and some guides and how you might do that. Um, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. This is Ephesians 2.10, for good works, which, he, which God has beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. That, that verse to me is just, it's precious. Did you know that you are a work from God? That he designed you, that you have a purpose, that he gave you a mission, that you are special and unique and he crafted you, and he shaped you. There is no such thing as a, a, as a non-valuable human being. God shapes each one of us. And the way he made you, he did it on purpose. You know, I, I, I hate when people are saying, well, why couldn't you be more like your brother, or why couldn't you be like your... You're not supposed to be. God made you you. And he celebrates in that. And so one of the things, there's, there's, I think there's seven indicators to help confirm your mission. And so if you look at your mission, you're, you're being in the zone. You know, Michael Jordan might say his mission was to play basketball. Well, what is your mission? What has God designed you for? And I don't think a mission necessarily mean, has to be uh, what you do as a job. You don't have to have your mission be what you do as a job, but a mission is what you do when you wake up every day, how you live, how you walk. And there are seven considerations to make sure that you're in your right spot. You know, maybe it is your job. Are you at that right position? The first is your passions. You know, some people like to fish. Some people like to go bowling. Some people like accounting. Those are weird people, all of them. But God puts that passion inside of people. I like all three, personally. So, uh, God puts that passion inside of you for a reason. And God isn't going to have you do something in your mission that you're not passionate about. If you hate your job, that's a bad sign. Um, personality. God gives different personalities to do different things. You know, I, I, if I were a robot and I said the exact same words that I gave to you tonight and had no personality, that probably wouldn't be very good and everyone would not like it. <laughs> he gave me a personality. I'm allowed to be me when I'm preaching even. So your personality needs to be part of your job. Don't try to fit yourself into something, you know, that like you can't be who you are. That's miserable. Um, ability. You know, living in Nashville, Tennessee, everybody wants to be the next Garth Brooks. You know, so you need to have good friends that are surround you that might say stuff like, hey, yeah, you're good. You need a music lesson would be really helpful. You know, that's important that you have the ability. You know, if I want to go be a nuclear physicist, I better have the ability to study for hours and hours and hours and, and love, you know, dirt and have a personality that can allow me to do that. The fourth thing is community. God isn't going to, to put you in a place where you don't have a vibrant community. And when you consider your mission and what God has you on the planet for, what community is that a part of? How, how are you going to grow within that community? The fifth thing 
is your history. Do you know that everything that happened in your life has a purpose? Hard stuff that you have gone through, I guarantee you there are millions of people that are going through that and you have the ability to serve them and walk through something with them. You know, I, I, I uh, in 19, I don't know, 97 maybe or 98, I was working at Radio Shack in, in Vermont and I hated it. <laughs> I mean, the boss was great, the, the work was great, but I just was like, ah, I'm so, I can't believe I'm working at Radio Shack in Vermont. I just don't like this job. And I would go in and I would dust electronics and I had to sit through hours of these like courses about, you know, homage on speakers and what are RCA cables. And I was just like, I hate this job. Three years later, I was a consultant setting up technology and complex computer systems and VCRs and all these things and $100 million lawsuits. And I was like, I'm sure glad I worked at Radio Shack so I knew how to do that. <laughs> God uses the history of what we've done in our life for today. The next is anointing. When God calls you to do a work, be it a, a house mom or a maid or a mechanic or a plumber, or a friend, or in the community, or whatever, he gives you the anointing and the authority and the ability to do that work. When God calls you to do a work, he gives you the anointing and the authority and the ability to do that work. And you need all three. And if you, you, you have the ability and the authority, and you're the boss, but you don't have the anointing, then you need to make sure that you're praying for it because anointing is critical. Are you, are, did God call you to do it? Are you simply walking in the finished work that he, he's already created? Or are you trying to do something outside of what God wants you to do? And finally, and I believe most importantly, is the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, in James it says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable. And when you're doing something that God wants you to be in, there's a pure motive, but then there's peace. And that peace from the Holy Spirit to know, yes, this is the direction that I'm supposed to work in. Now, here's the good news. I believe it is absolutely possible to be in the middle of that spot, to know that you're in the calling that God has called you in. I believe, personally, I'm in that spot, and it took me several years to work that out. But don't settle. If you're not there, don't settle. You'll seek and run hard after God until he shows you what that is. And when you get there, you'll know it. So how do you write your personal mission statement? Here's four sentences with an eye towards eternity. Thinking about your gifts and your callings and your anointing and your authority and your history. Your mission is to serve this need with these gifts and strengths, working in community with and name your community towards this eventual impact. Now, there are times in our life when we're really stressed out and crazy and busy and running around. Not a good time to work on your personal mission statement. At other times, you have some time set aside where you can go off into the woods and you can think and you can pray and you can consider what is it that is truly valuable? How am I aligning my life with it? That's a great time to work on your personal mission statement so that you can point back to it and look back to it at points in your life. And so I hope what I've been able to lay out tonight is some tools for considering your mission and, and also some tools for writing that down. And we're going to break into our small groups and talk about it a little bit. Let me pray. Father, um, Lord, your, your word speaks about putting to flight 10,000 and uh, 
Lord, your word says if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, be moved and, 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 and be taken from here to there and it'll be done. And God, you, you took a little boy who, 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 who had a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread and he just, he, he gave them to you and he said, God, here's all the fish that I got. Here's all the bread that I've got. This is my life. What's my mission? And you took that and you multiplied it and you fed 5,000 people with it. And I'm sure that wasn't, the ver- that wasn't the last thing that that little boy did, but I, it was probably just the very first, Lord, when he connected everything that, he had been, that had been put into his hands and he gave it to you. And God, I pray that each one of us would use those things that you have placed in our life, that incredible value that you have placed in each of us, Lord, as we offer it to you, that you would guide us on a mission, that you would help us to articulate and write down how we should live and what we should do, and that in that mission, we would find our joy and in community and transformation and charity and in our family, we would worship you, God, that at the end of our lives, we would look back and be glad that we made these choices and that as we turn forward to heaven, you would say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we pray this in your matchless name, in Jesus' name, amen.